I just wanted to um, first of all start by, uh, by at least um, asking you to do something. I want you all to fold your arms. Now I want you to fold them the other way. <laughs> Feels a bit uncomfortable? Some of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about might make you feel like your arms are folded the other way. And I have a belief that um, discomfort is the place in which we do our learning. I hope you can hear me because I tend to wander a little bit and I'd like to be able to do that as well. So I guess uh, you need to know that I come, I come to this as, uh, as an imposter. I'm definitely someone who is not an interpreter, not a translator, but I've had two very significant experiences in my life, very early in my life, that made me realise that language is power and the people who have power have access. The first experience was when I was in, um, when I was about seven years of age and I was interpreting for my mother who was going in for surgery and I had no words for that critical thing called a hip in Arabic. And I tell you to this day, I thank God that she didn't have her leg removed because there was no other source of dialogue other than my, my ability to try to approximate as a seven-year-old. The other experience is a bit funnier. Uh, it was when I was in year 10 and I was a prefect at my school and uh, I had been suspended for, ta for taping one of my teachers. Um, they brought my parents in and they sat them down and went through an elaborate process of how dreadful their daughter was, how she's a wonderful girl, but she's, you know, she's done this and she really, really needs, is going to be um, suspended for two whole weeks. Well, the only words my parent heard were, wonderful girl, good parents, two weeks. <laughs> so until the day my father passed away, which was three years ago at the age of 104, he still used to tell, God bless him, he still used to tell the story of how his daughter was the only child in our village that he knew that got two weeks off for being so exceptional at school. <laughs> language is power. And let me tell you, there is no jokes about language in the domestic violence context. I'm going to use some examples from the policing space because I have the privileged position of not only having access through Multicultural New South Wales, who we have representatives here today, but to have the opportunity to train some of our interpreters in Sydney, but also the opportunity to train our officers in the use of interpreters. And I can tell you, there is no such thing as a bad interpreter. There is only someone who doesn't know how to use one. So for me, the issue here is what do we do? You cannot be professionals in every aspect, as I mentioned earlier, but what you are is holders of a skill. And in New South Wales, in Victoria, across Australia, we cannot do our jobs without you. When I send training with my officers, the issue isn't how do we support Cal communities. The issue is what do you as a police officer need to do your job every day in a continually changing environment. So let's be very clear on where the responsibility lies here. It's shared, but it's weighted. I think um, when you look at the lens of, um, of interpreting through policing, interpreters will find themselves in areas that really draw on your resilience. And I want to read to you, and I apologise for those of you that may have heard this before. I want to read to you two uh, very short stories, a day in the life of a police officer and a day in the life of an interpreter. And you'll see from the story that they are virtually the same day. Okay? And these are legitimate stories that I witnessed. But before I do that, I want to give the context. In New South Wales Police and in Victoria, I know it's the case, when we talk about the use of interpreters, it's never a one-off. In the domestic violence context, there are about seven or eight or nine points of entry where interpreters are critical. At that moment, a woman or a man in a same-sex DV or a man because it's the woman that's the, that, uh, that is the perpetrator, whatever the context is, there will be that triple O call. Be very clear, that process of triple O is clearly linked directly into interpreter services. So that interpreting doesn't depend on someone asking for an interpreter, it happens as quickly and as automatically as humanly possible. Then there's the point at which police go out. We have a process in New South Wales called the Domestic Violence Evidence in Chief, where they go out with a camera 
guess what? And they record in the woman's voice what has just happened. With blood coming out of her eye or children screaming, it is at the scene. Guess what? In many cases, the only women that don't get recorded are cowled women, women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Why? Because we have to ask permission to record. So we have been trialling the recording, the asking of permission through the use of a telephone interpreter and then through on FaceTime having that interpreter present while the woman tells her story in first language so that we capture that immediate impact. That's one entry point. The next point is when she's back at the station giving a formal statement. The third entry, the fourth entry point may be when some med medical health is brought in, medical support is brought in to assist her with her wounds or whatever it might be. There's another point at which there may be clarification. Let's be very clear. The statement that a woman gives is not the statement she hears in court. Because what she hears in court is what the police need to put before the court to get a prosecution. So when she says, my husband is a wonderful man, he's never hurt me before, this is the first time this has happened, what she will hear is this has happened in court. Do you get where I'm going here? You've seen this, you've been there. Then there's the point at which she may be referred to an agency or a service. Again, she's negotiating this via an interpreter. Then there's the point at which follow -up, victim follow-up happens through an interpreter. Then there's the point at which the children may need support. Again, it's needed. You see my point? It's not just one space. So in terms of uh, the few minutes that I have with you, I'm trying to cram vicarious trauma into this space is killing me, but um, it's about surviving our jobs. It's a crucial part of the process. And interpreting and translating is an intersectional thing. It doesn't exist in isolation. It's about you as a profession. It's about the service you provide. It's about the skill sets you bring with you. It's about the local and global issues that position you as either wanted or not wanted in that room. And I can tell you in areas like counter-terrorism, it's a distraction. In areas like managing a human source, an informant, we're still struggling. And in fact, New South Wales has been trialling this. And in terms of a conduit for other professions to do their job, I'm telling you, we cannot do it without you. So, a very, have I got time to tell these two stories? A day in the life of a police officer. A police officer may begin his morning muster, a meeting at the station, then, call, then he's called to a road accident, a fatality, where he's then required to deliver a death notice to parents who do not know their child's are not coming home that night. After scrolls of paperwork and a coffee on the run, still processing the tears of a mother who has lost her son, they attend a domestic violence incident, which results in not only the removal of the offender, but a trip to the hospital for the partner and child who are suffering cuts and bruises. They have had to engage an interpreter for both parties and contact family support for the victim. On the way back to the station, the officers notice an elderly man sitting in the curb of a busy intersection. They stop and move him to safety before attempting to find out who is his next of kin, as at this point they've noticed he appears to have some dementia of some sort. They organise to have him taken to the local hospital. They eventually return to the station and ensure the day's events are accurately recorded. But before they can finish this task, they're called out again to what appears to be a break and enter, only to find that a woman and her two children are held hostage by an intruder. The negotiators are on the way, and after a quick canvas of the neighbouring houses, it's revealed that the woman has only been in Australia for six months. She's a survivor of torture and trauma, and she speaks very little English. Two interpreters are called out, as the intruder, who also doesn't speak English, and at this stage, the woman's husband has also turned up at the scene and assisting officers with uh, the interaction. He too requires an interpreter, interpreter three. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and the telephone is on the only immediate source that can be used with him. Before leaving the day, these two officers spend the last 30 minutes of their shift calling yesterday's victims as part of victim follow-up, which is our policy. They're both still feeling the impact of having to deliver the death notice earlier. As they both drive home, their thoughts are with the hostage. Will she be safe? They head, they head home and try to leave behind the day, just enough to be able to greet their partners and their own children with a smile and not a sigh. The interpreter has spent the morning interpreting for a solicitor. 
then a two-hour session interpreting for a psychological assessment of an elderly man suspected of having dementia. He reminds her of her own father, who has recently passed away. She finds herself becoming quite emotional. After a quick coffee, she receives a call that she is required at Police Station X. When she arrives and with very little briefing, she finds herself interpreting for an alleged serial sex offender. Her heart races as in that moment she realised that this is the person they were talking about on this morning's news. The whole time she is interpreting, her heart is racing and fear and caution take over. She's doing remarkably well until the alleged offender begins to describe in detail the morning's attack on the child. The interview is being filmed on our Eris tape as per protocol. The victim is close in age to her daughter and she finds herself developing knots in her stomach. She wants to be sick. Her inner voice is saying, you're a professional, no emotions required. Her heart is saying, I feel sick, this man is a monster. In reality, all that she says is what she is there to interpret. The interview takes what seems to be ages, ages, even with regular breaks and checks, it feels like forever. By the time she leaves the station, a crowd from her own community have gathered outside the police station, wanting information about the offender and acting like a vigilante group. She's a professional. She's a member of that community. She's a mum. She is exhausted and she is worried that someone will recognise her and she'll have to say, I cannot say anything as I'm bound by a code of confidentiality. The community thinks she sides with the police. She arrives home. Her shoes are off, but her emotions are running wild. This is the environment where trauma and vicarious trauma kicks in. This context is not new to you and the context goes beyond just DV because let me tell you ladies and gentlemen, uh, domestic violence is often a presenting issue for a series of other issues and we have had domestic violence as the presenting issue for female genital mutilation, for human trafficking, for um, forced marriage, for um, honour based violence. So the issue of domestic violence cannot be read in isolation to the context in which that violence is occurring and often the motivations and the purposes of that violence. And I think the reality is that if you have something like what's on the board, a refugee female from a new and small community, a survivor of torture, she has fear of police, she's terrified of being taken to the police station, she's been assaulted, the officer needs to build rapport with her because how, why else would she talk? The officer needs to try to build rapport through you as an interpreter because it's not about you having rapport with that individual, it's about that officer having rapport. They are the ones that have to continue the work. It is about the, to consider her emotional safety. It's about introducing the interpreter in a confident, comfortable, secure and honest way. It is about talking about confidentiality when her emotions are high and it's about ensuring she has physical medical attention if that's required. All this while maintaining rapport, reading context, watching her body language and ensuring her emotional safety stays intact. Scenario two, you know, a negotiator's attend a scene. It's a man about to jump off a cliff. And so there the interpreter arrives and they have to engage simultaneous immediately because there's no turn taking when someone's about to jump off a cliff. That voice of the user, the voice of the interpreter must be one. The level of stress that causes an interpreter to feel like every word needs to have some sort of accuracy, well, absolute accuracy, given that not understanding the motivation of the officers in using that technique or that word or that issue. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that using and briefing interpreters, no matter what the situation is, is something we take very seriously in policing. It does not happen all the time. We get it wrong, but I can tell you when we get it wrong, I usually hear about it and there's a way to work with that. Because without that briefing, you will never know what you're going into. And that is the starting point for trauma. 
I'm just going to um, jump across this a little bit. But the limited or the initial impact of the critical incidents on profession professionals from the fallout of the traumatic environments that you'll find yourself in have been very well researched. And there's nothing I can tell you that's going to be probably anything new. The same potential exists and it's, un it's completely researched uh, that says that the psychological distress and vicarious trauma of interpreters in their role as secondary witnesses to stories is absolutely happens. There's no question. But I guess what one interpreter said to me, I've been working for years as an interpreter. They see me as a mentor and as a professional. If I let any new, anyone know the impact of interpreting for cases that involve children being killed since I lost my own child, I'm afraid they won't give me the work and I need the work. We are operating in organisations where uh, interpreter agencies have to get their heads around the professionalism of an interpreter who is self-aware, who knows when they can and they can't, versus the need to get someone out to the job. And my, my um, bet goes with the interpreter who can say to me, I can't do this job, it's too close to home. That is the professional in my eyes. And I guess we talk about psych ache. And I love this term because you know when you ache, my feet are aching at the moment because I shouldn't have heels on, but years of dealing with victims of brutal abuse often wears people down. And I thought I was okay until one day I went home and drank a bottle of scotch and tried to kill myself. I didn't want to die, I just wanted the ache to stop. I wanted the pictures in my head to stop playing. When that picture starts to play, you know it's an indicator. And I now know my triggers. When the sadness starts to build, I talk about it. And I go for a swim. The water washes it away for this interpreter. It's always there, but now I look at it instead of pushing it away. It is so powerful. And interpreter G says, interpreting for police, and it was traumatic. I was in session for hours and although they cared for my physical well-being, they gave me breaks, water, coffee, constantly asked me if I needed anything. What I really needed was to just exhale and scream and say out loud that this is too hard to take. But I went back in, I kept interpreting and then I went home. It was hard to explain to my wife why I couldn't sleep. We are bound by a code of confidentiality, you know. I wish the cops would have just asked, how are you? And this is crucial in our debriefing. And I say to our officers, if you do nothing else but say, are you okay, as you walk them to their car. Not walk them to the front, walk them to the safe place they need to be. And it's more than words can say, because really all of these things listed here are the context in which we are continually uh, the aspects of our psyche that are continually being, uh, being uh, challenged. It's not just about incredible trauma, it's those little things that cause stress every day and how they accumulate. I'm racing through this. But something we're not talking about in our professions, even police don't talk about this, is not post-traumatic stress or trauma reaction. It's a notion that in psychology I've become aware of over the 30 years I've worked in this space, particularly having worked for 11 years with survivors of torture and trauma. And it taught me, I'm so grateful to my brothers and sisters who taught me how to do my job in this space. It's about multiple trauma stress disorder because everybody has things that traumatise them, yeah? You can be traumatised by a fly flying into your salad, yeah? It can cause trauma. It's immediate, it's there, you deal with it. But then there's this increased generalisation. I have a car accident and I don't want to go in the car for a few days. That is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. But if that doesn't shift, and there's a time lapse, what often occurs is what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. When I don't go, want to go into a car, I don't even want to cross the road because there are cars on it. But what concerns me and what I think we need to consider in this space is what we call po multiple trauma. And that is when you know by the mere nature of your job that you are going to go back into situations that traumatise you. Because if you are working with police, I tell you, one in two things you go into will have a trauma attached to it. 
So it's this knowing that although whew, I'm home tonight, the shoes are off and I'm comfortable, that tomorrow's call might be traumatic again. It's a multiple cumulative exposure to things that create dissonance within us. Police suffer from this. Survivors of torture and trauma suffer from it. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that interpreters, if we do not catch this and nip it in the bud and put into place systems that make it normal to talk about trauma, that it's not unprofessional, it is normal, then we are at risk of creating an occupation that suffers from cumulative trauma. It's all not all that bad. But we have different words for this, and I want to expose you to some of the words. Vicarious trauma, I'm going to define in one second. But we also have compassion fatigue. And someone talked before about having empathy. Can I put it to you? It is human to be empathic. And what I had to learn when I was working with survivors of torture and trauma every day as a psychologist, I had to learn to allow my empathy to reach a certain point before it became me carrying the empathy because I had no empathy left because it had been drained. So it's important to recognise that you can feel for someone but you, that you know that point at which you have to let it go and let someone who is in the job of caring for their emotional wellbeing to take that over. There is burnout and that was mentioned earlier by our, our wonderful speaker this morning. There's sadness, which is a normal reaction. Don't be afraid of that. There's things or the habits that are created by self-medication. Who goes home and has a glass of wine <laughs> after a hard day? Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Because that's what happened. Eventually, one glass isn't enough. Because it is. And I can tell you, and I hope, oh, I know it's being recorded, so I could be out of a job tomorrow. But I know police suffer a lot of alcoholism because they self-medicate. And we have now other ways, thank heavens. Depression and anger. What is depression? We all suffer from depressive experiences, but we don't all carry depression. Sleeplessness and rumination. Have you found that you're telling yourself the story again and again and again in your head? The rumination is crucial. But vicarious trauma stands in a really important place. It is the tr it's a psychological term that's used to refer to changes in the person that, are, that can occur when you are repeatedly being exposed to traumatic material. And I can tell you as a psychologist and as a lover of the profession, and I mean a lover of the profession, that the, the ability to tell someone what they're walking into before they walk in has an immediate effect in reducing the impact of any trauma that's caused. Increased predictability, decrease in stress. If you know that you are going in to do an interview um, about, about a child that has been murdered, then your brain already takes you to a space of self-protection. So when those photos are placed in front of the offender and he's asked questions about them, this is not your first exposure. You've already, your psyche started to prepare. This is such a powerful thing, which is why I get really upset when I hear the stories of our own officers that do not brief their interpreters. We have said to them, going into a session with an interpreter and not knowing how to use one, not knowing how to brief, conduct the session and debrief is like giving you a gun and not training you in how to use it because the effect is exactly the same. And I'm grateful that they are now hearing that, that message. Vicarious trauma is, pr is a profound shift in our whole world view that occurs in many helping professions when they work with clients who are experiencing it. And there's a lot of research around that. But compassion fatigue is that thing that no one talks about. And it's also known as secondary traumatic stress. And it's a condition characterised by the gradual lessening of compassion over time. Have you got to the point where you actually walk into something and you feel nothing? Now that can be a great thing. It can also be an indicator that you need to pull back and regroup <coughs> around that. And I think it's common among individuals that work directly with trauma victims, nurses, doctors, police, but I'm telling you they're all the places that you are in and nobody's talking about interpreters when they're, when they're educating those professions. 
yeah? And that's what I aim to do in the work that I'm doing. And there are many physical signs, have a quick read, of um, for compassion fatigue, many physical signs. There are many behavioural signs. And just to allude to a couple of them, things like anger and irritability can, see, can be because it's a hot day and I've had a big day, but they can also be indicators of other things. So tune into your reactions. Don't be afraid of them because our bodies will tell us what we need. And psychological signs, and this is the, the area that becomes quite concerning, where we start to distance, where we start to get really negative in our workspace and negative for the same things, not for new things, right through to our resentment, dread of working in certain situations, less enjoyment and hypersensitivity. When your heart starts to beat, if I can use policing as an example, just as you enter the police station. And sadness, I've got to put, I had to put this in because sadness I call the safe version. Sadness is a normal reaction. I met uh, yesterday on the streets of Melbourne a young man who's homeless and he was sitting outside Pellegrini's Cafe on the, fo on the adjacent corner. And, you know, we all walk past people in our lives every day. I do it all the time. But for some reason, it was a really hot afternoon. I had two bottles of water and I just plonked a bottle next to him and said hello. And he looked up at me and he had tears in his eyes. And for the next hour and a half, he told me the story of his friendship with the man who'd been killed in Pellegrini's. And I said to him, what is the biggest sadness? And he said, I tried to go to his funeral. His family wanted me to come, but the police wouldn't let a homeless man in there. And so I found myself talking about sadness with him. And he taught me, I'm telling you, I was, it took me a while to unwind from that one because it was very emotional. But he said to me, don't be sad. He said, I know, I know that people see me the way I am. They think that I'm nothing but I know who I am. And I think that's a critical message for anybody in situations where you are the voice. You are not the interviewer. You are not the lead. You are not there to organise an interview. You are not there to take a lead in the situations you interpret. You are a valuable, vital conduit for people to do their job and for people to receive the services that they require. And we do have a whole lot of survival techniques and I can't emphasise more that quality grid. I've, I haven't got this right yet, so I'm, I'm a fake when it comes to this. But think about your professional life. Think about the support you have and think about the self-care. Think about that moment where it's okay to say no to a job because you've just done too many of those. And if your agencies go, oh, come on, you need to do it, then it's really important to remind them that it's a person who knows when their bucket is full that is the, the professional in this space, not someone who just keeps doing it. And I think there is an employee, employer responsibility here. And um, I say to the employers in the room, be mindful, we have to work out ways to allow our interpreters to debrief immediately after their situations. Because I can tell you when I was working a very serious case and I was going into court every day and it was a case that we used through interpreters, there was the context in which I was on a train going into the city and it just so happened that the interpreter and their child were on the train and they were talking about the case. And I had to disclose that. And it nearly meant that a criminal was back off on the streets. We all have to debrief where you debrief, who you debrief to, and the context in which you debrief is what is not just your responsibility, it's your employer's responsibility. And we've been talking with Nati and Osset and a few of them, and particularly with Sandra Hale, who you know talks to me a lot, and I'm grateful to her for this, around how do we have a debrief line or something that gives interpreters just a few minutes anonymously to get on the phone to someone and say, I can't tell you what it was or where it was, but I'm feeling really, really sad because I just witnessed something that reminded me of personal experience and just have someone to talk to. And coping is a crucial skill, and I'll let you read that. And there are a whole lot of coping resources. But let's be mindful here. We are talking about a cross-cultural and a diversity context. 
Just because you work in middle class and upper and maybe um, less fortunate classes of people, you come with a culture, a background, a way of doing business and a way of coping. Draw on your experiences. And we have many different ways where people make sense of the experiences that they're faced with. And resilience is a crucial space here as well. And it's the opposite to being vulnerable. Resilience means you still feel pain. You just know that you're feeling it and you know that there's something you can do with it. And resourcefulness, two different things. It's the ability to deal well with new or difficult situations and to find solutions to the problem. I couldn't exist if I didn't have colleagues that I trusted who I could go to and say, just listen to me for five minutes. And they fall asleep because it's usually about two hours. And then there's the notions of happiness, because where there's sadness, there's happiness. Fill your pots, fill your emotional reserves with those things that make you laugh, those stories that make you happy, um, those experiences. You know, after seeing that gentleman yesterday, I was so sad at the reality of homelessness yet again, and I felt helpless and I felt like a fraud that I was going to be going and having a meal in a restaurant when this person was sitting out in the heat drinking my bottle of water. But I had to remember that that's how my dad started. He too was homeless and he too had to get through that and that made me believe that this person who taught me my lesson has the, some level of resources to be able to draw on and I hope to see him this afternoon because I'm going to walk back that way. And emotional intelligence. Don't deny yourself the ability to identify and develop your own emotional intelligence because there are five factors that contribute to that. Self-awareness, that ability to know when your bucket is full. Emotional regulation, those skills. And I had to learn them when I was working with survivors and I had to learn them when I'm working with police because they traumatise me all the time. Is, is what is that point at which I don't do what I did earlier and then blurt out a whole lot of things? How do I pull myself back? How do I stop, absorb, listen, reflect, speak? How do we do that? And empathy. I'd be a real hoodwinker if I didn't say to you empathy is crucial. We find a connection with everybody. Can I ask you, the person you need to have the most connection with is the person who has employed you to facilitate their conversation. If you build that connection with the police officer, the doctor, the lawyer, the whatever, then everything else you have to offer is possible and it will come. You're not there to do it for them. You cannot do it for them. And I was gonna show you a little video, but I won't. And finally, I wanna ask you a question. You know I like activities. This is the cope of curve, this is the U curve of adjustment, the U curve of death and dying, the U curve of functional functioning. Where would you put yourself on that curve? Are you honeymooning? <laughs> Are you, life is fantastic, I'm good, I go to work, I come home, I shut off, it doesn't affect me. Are you in that point of what the hell have I done? Five years of study to do this job? Yeah? Or are you in a place where you say, I don't know whether I should be here or whether I should be doing something different? Or have you come through that curb and you're going, wow, there are great programs, there are great speakers, there are great, a whole lot of things that help me move along my way. And eventually that point where you function so capably that it doesn't matter if you slide back down. That's what we do as human beings. But then you can slide back up again or move across or jump across. Where are you on the curve? Thank you.